reading from the Lord, word of the Lord is from the book, book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hands, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Our next reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that Jesus had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. And finally, we read from the teachings of the new church from a book called Arcana Celestia, or Secrets of Heaven. And this is a passage explaining that everything the Lord gives to us is given freely. And then it says, The Lord does, it is true, demand humility, worship, thanksgiving, and much else from a person which seem like repayment, so that his gifts do not seem to be free. But the Lord does not demand these things for his own sake, for the divine derives no glory at all from a person's humility, worship, or thanksgiving. It is utterly inconceivable that any self-love should exist within the divine, causing him to require such actions for his own sake. Rather, they are required for the person's own sake. For if someone possesses humility, he is able to accept good from the Lord, since in that case he has been parted from self-love and its evils, which stand in the way of his accepting it. Therefore, the Lord desires a state of humility in a person for that person's sake because the Lord can flow in with heavenly good when that state exists in him. The same applies to worship and thanksgiving. Some things in the Lord's word are hard to understand, and other things he's made wonderfully, wonderfully clear. He could not have made it any clearer that the first of all the commandments is that he, the Lord, is one and that we're to love him with everything we have, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. On one level, it makes perfect sense that this is the first of all the commandments. And there are probably many Christians who have never questioned this. Children never seem to have any issue with this teaching. The Lord is really important, so of course it's really important that we love him. But to a more adult and more skeptical mind, this teaching can seem strange. It can seem not quite right that the thing the Lord stresses most emphatically is that we are to love Him. After all, if another human being did this, we'd call them self-absorbed. Imagine a person saying to you, 
as far as I'm concerned, the most important thing in the universe is that everybody love me. We'd call that person's attitude totally selfish, the polar opposite of a loving attitude. Love is all about wanting what's good for someone other than ourselves. And yet, we're taught very clearly in the scriptures, and even more clearly in the heavenly doctrines of the new church, that the Lord is love itself. Everything he has ever done was done because he wanted to bless something other than himself. We and the whole of creation exist because he wants to give us heaven. In the teachings of the new church, we're told this mighty system, which is called the universe, is a single unit coherently organized from beginning to end. Because God had one end in view in creating it. To create from the human race a heaven of angels. If that's his true goal, to give us heaven, to give us joy, then why is his first commandment about himself? Why is the most important of all the commandments about loving him? People sometimes talk about the glory of God in a way that adds to this confusion around loving the Lord. The word has a lot to say about the glory of God, so it's not incorrect to use that phrase. Glory just means light or brilliance, and it has connotations of grandeur and power, and these are all appropriate things to attribute to God. In the word, he's often portrayed as literally glorious. His face shines like the sun. And the word says that we should give glory to him. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be glory given. We're called to remember that he is worthy of honor and reverence in a way that we're not. Glory belongs to him. But some people have taken that truth and added to it the idea that giving glory to God is, in the end, the only thing that matters and the only thing that he wants. It has been argued that creation exists for the glory of God and that we exist for the glory of God. That the sole purpose of our lives is to give glory to our creator. But if that's true, if God's purpose in creating this world was to create something that would give him the glory he is owed, doesn't that make God selfish? And this idea that the purpose of creation is to give glory to God really has no scriptural support. The word says often that we should give glory to God, but nowhere does it say that we do that because he needs it or he wants it. We're asked to give glory to him not for his sake, but for ours. And why is it good for us to give glory to God? Giving him glory really just means acknowledging the truth that he's God and we're not. That he is powerful and merciful and good and we need his power and his mercy. And when we acknowledge those truths, we take away the barriers that stand between us and him. And that's what was taught in that passage that I read from Arcana Celestia where it said, the Lord does not demand these things for his own sake. For the divine derives no glory at all from a person's humility, worship, or thanksgiving. It is utterly inconceivable that any self-love should exist within the divine, causing him to require such actions for his own sake. Rather, they are required for the person's own sake. 
For if someone possesses humility, he is able to accept good from the Lord. Elsewhere in the teachings of the church, we're told that a proud heart cannot receive anything from God because a proud heart is hard, a heart of stone. A humble heart, on the other hand, is soft, a heart of flesh. The gifts of God flow into a humble heart, just like the warmth of our blood flows through our bodies. And we're asked to give glory to God because that process of acknowledging the truth and humbling ourselves and turning to Him allows Him to bless us. It allows him to flow into us with the joy that he wants to give us. And loving the Lord works exactly the same way. Loving the Lord isn't about adoring him so that he feels good about himself. If that were his primary purpose, then that would be selfish. Loving The Lord is important because it makes it possible for him to do what he truly wants, which is to draw close to human beings and bless them. It's pretty obvious if we think about it that if we equate being loved with feeling good about ourselves, we're doing something wrong. The Lord asking us to love him has nothing to do with him needing to feel good about himself. That's not what love is. But to be fair, we human beings get our ideas about love muddled up pretty easily. Love isn't a feeling, but it produces feelings. It produces very strong feelings. And those feelings of Love, of intimacy, of safety, of happiness, of peace, those are byproducts of love. And so it makes sense that we associate them with love. And it makes sense that we sometimes say we're seeking love when in fact what we're seeking is those feelings of intimacy and happiness. And it's normal that we do that, but it is also backwards. It's wanting to be loved for our own sakes. When, of course, love is actually about wanting to give joy to someone outside of yourself. Another way of putting it is that loving someone is about wanting what they want. In the teachings of the New Church, we read, the essence of love and charity is to make two people, so to speak, into one. When one person loves another as himself or more than himself, he sees the other in himself and himself in the other. This anyone can appreciate if only he will direct his attention to what love is or to persons who love each other mutually. The will of the one is that of the other. They are, as it were, inwardly joined together and separate from each other in body only. And these ideas start to make it all come together. Loving the Lord is about being joined to him. It's about wanting what he wants, or loving as he loves. And his love is boundless love for the whole human race. It all becomes crystal clear when we look at what he teaches in the Gospel of John about what it means to love him. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And in another place, he says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. If we look at those statements in total isolation, we could conclude that God just wants to be obeyed that it's about his authority, that he's power tripping. But just before he states that to love him is to keep his commandments, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. 
And after he teaches that to love him is to keep his commandments, he says again, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. As he sees it, loving him isn't about him at all. It's about us obeying his command to love one another. That is, to love one another as he loves us. It's about offering, us offering his love to our neighbor. It's about us in our own small way helping him fill another heart with warmth and with joy. And so in the teachings of the church, we're told love to the Lord cannot possibly be separated from love to the neighbor. For the Lord's love is directed toward the whole human race, whom he wishes to save eternally and join so completely to himself that not a single one of them perishes. Anyone, therefore, who has love to the Lord possesses the Lord's love and so cannot help loving the neighbor. And that's why in the reading from the Gospel of Mark, the Lord said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. If we understand them the way he wants us to understand them, these two greatest commandments cannot be separated. The second follows from the first, and together they accomplish his true goal, which is to see his children blessed by love itself. The Lord asks us to help him love people, which is an amazing thing to be asked to do. And it's also something that we can take in the wrong direction or, or run away with which is why some of those things I said earlier about humility and giving glory to God are important. It's a humble heart that receives from God. A humble heart is a heart of flesh, a heart in which love lives and moves. Humbling ourselves before God means acknowledging from the heart that any love that's truly worth having comes from him and not from us. Humbling ourselves means giving all glory to him and him alone. And glory is really nothing other than the light of love. The command that we love our neighbor is the second of all the commands and not the first. Because if we love our neighbor without first bowing before God and receiving his love, then what we're offering to our neighbor is in large part merely our love. And that might not seem so bad. We might say, my love is great and I think everybody should have it. But the truth is that we human beings understand love relatively poorly. And our own love is so easily mixed up with selfishness or with flawed ideas of what happiness is. When we try to love other people from ourselves, the Lord will be with us, working in secret to mix his love into what we're giving. If our intentions are good, he will work with them. But the gift that we give in that case won't be as powerful as the gift that we would give if we put him first. If we sought to love our neighbor, not from ourselves, but from him. As a simple illustration of this, we often confuse love with feeling good. And so we sometimes assume that loving people means helping them feel good. And the Lord does want us to feel good, but his real goal is to be joined to us so that we can live with him in heaven where we will find eternal joy. 
joy that will make all the happiness we've known so far seem pale. Reaching that goal is far more important to him than our short-term comfort or pleasure. And if we truly want to make our neighbor happy in a way that lasts, we need to try to love as he loves. His purpose, the purpose that underlies and moves within his whole creation, is to create a heaven from, for, from the human race. And he wants heaven for us for no other reason than that he loves us and he wants us close to him. And that is why the first of all the commandments is that we love him with all our heart and soul. When we love him, we share something with him. And he draws closer to us and we to him. He says, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Amen. Please rise.